Hello and welcome to our Office Hours presentation for today. This Office Hours is a relaxed, informal mentoring program that we do every Monday at noon Pacific time. This recording is going to be available online for a few days and all recordings are going to be archived in our members area. This is Office Hours presentation number 44, so there are 43 other unique presentations that you can tune in on and gain value from. The reasons we do it is because I know that being a successful entrepreneur, small business owner can be a great experience, but it's really tough. You need the education, the training, and the tools, and the team in order to succeed. I want you to get to know me because when you do, you'll know that I really do care about you, and I want you to succeed, and I put you first. I want you to live an abundant and joyful life. I want to do everything I can to help make that happen for you. Our agenda on these calls today is an in-depth discussion of a business success principle. I offer some closing remarks, some special offers, an invitation for next week's session, and then open questions and answers. First questions and discussion around the topic of the day, and then open to well, anything that you want to talk about. So I encourage you to join us during the course of the call in our Facebook Brilliant Business Group, which is at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash brilliant business. You can make comments, ask questions. Share insights and, and action items that come up for you on the call today. Um, and I also encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to like my business page on Facebook. You'll get your energy of the day message every day when you do that. I've been putting out an inspirational message every morning uh, for the last 255 or something mornings like that. And I anticipate continuing that for the next, well, for the, uh, for the foreseen future out there. So however long it lasts, I know I've got at least 1,200 more to go. Today's topic is on the Blue Ocean Strategy, How to Stand Out from the Crowd. It's based on the book by the same name, The Blue Ocean Strategy, with the subtitle, How to Create Uncontested Market Space and Make the Competition Irrelevant, by Dr. Chan Kim and Renee Malborn, published in 2005. This has been one of the seminal works over the last seven or eight years, and I'm excited to bring you concepts and principles from that book today. As always, I relate the topic of the day to one or more of the key performance areas of business, uh, and this one relates specifically to leadership and about marketing and product development. It, it has to do with constructing the business model for your business, about the products and services you're going to offer and the marketplaces that you're going to address, and it is one of the primary responsibilities of the leadership at the company to oversee product and product development and marketing. And this is real important stuff when it comes to product development and marketing. Our agenda today is we're going to talk about basic oceanography. Then I'm going to talk about the six principles that come from the book and give you three of the different um, really great strategies they have or, or techniques that they have for developing a blue ocean strategy. First, value innovation, then the four actions framework, and the strategy canvas. We're going to talk about characteristics of a good strategy, and then, as I always do, we're going to sum it up with the bottom line at the end of the presentation. First, I want to talk about approaches to competition. I talk about this in Beyond Business Survival a little bit, in the, the key four ways in which you can differentiate yourself from the marketplace. The first one is to have a better or a higher quality product, to do something that no one else does so that, or better than anyone else, so that you really stand out as being superior. The example would be Lexus or Mercedes-Benz or Infinity, very high quality premium brands that are better than most other cars out there. You can also complete on the basis of speed, where you can get things done quicker uh, and, and save, your, save your customers a lot of time. Or you can compete on being cheaper having a less expensive product like Walmart. Walmart's claim to fame is everyday low prices and they live up to that every day. And the fourth way to compete with, with people in your marketplace is to be different, um, which means that you don't have to be better, faster, or cheaper. You just need to be different. And some of the, the most prevalent examples of that we see are in the fashion industry where you're just the newest model or the latest thing. Not necessarily better, faster, or cheaper, but you're new, and that means a lot to a lot of people. Well, the Blue Ocean Strategy is about being so different, so different in your marketplace that you actually create a brand new marketplace so different from your competition that you make the competition irrelevant. 
the, uh, the basic oceanography says that there are two types of oceans in the world today. There are red oceans and blue oceans. In the red oceans, it's representing a very highly competitive and very established industry. The term red ocean comes from the blood in the water. It's a little, little gruesome, but that's where they came up with the analogy because there are lots of sharks in a very highly competitive environment. You really have to watch out or you'll get bitten and shed a little blood. Blue oceans, on the other hand, denote brand new industries or ways of providing value to your customer in ways that are so different than everybody else that there is no competition, that nobody else really compares to you. It's like being an apple in a world of oranges. We're not trying to be a better orange. We're, we're wanting to be an apple that's so dramatically different that you don't even see our products and services and our company in the same league with any of the other comp competition out there. In the Red Oceans games, the rules are known, and the participants try to outperform each other. In fact, many times they try to destroy each other. Um, and there are some strategies for dealing in with Red Ocean, but today we're going to talk about the exact opposite, which is in the Blue Oceans game, you tap into untapped market space where nobody else is doing what you want to do. There's no competition, and hence there is no rules. You get to make it all up for yourself. And your focus then is on demand creation, not in positioning yourself versus anybody else who's already in the market space. And what that creates is an opportunity for highly profitable growth. Because you're just focused on demand creation, you don't really have any rules when it comes to um, competitive pricing, etc. You can create an extremely highly profitable company that's very rapidly growing because you are so different from the competition. Um, in fact, the message entirely from the Blue Ocean strategy is that the best way to beat the competition is to stop trying to beat the competition. The best way to win the game is to not play the game by their rules. You just don't do that. You figure out what everybody else is doing and you do something dramatically different from that. The six principles of the Blue Ocean strategy are number one is to reconstruct market boundaries, which means to carve out find a demand pattern in the marketplace and reconstruct it so that you're not competing squarely or even or even close to competing squarely with everybody else. Focus on the big picture, which means the market dynamics, not necessarily on the numbers at all. So this is not a numbers game to start off with. It is a product development and positioning game to start off with. You want to reach beyond the existing demand in the marketplace and get the sequence right so that you can create the strategy, create your offering, understand what your positioning is, launch it, and then and make sure you get to market with a very, very innovative product. There are two other principles in the Blue Ocean strategy that we're not going to talk about today because they have to do with execution strategies, and those are to overcome your key organizational hurdles inside the company and to build the execution into the strategy itself, to really focus on how are we going to build this and how are we going to deliver this from day one. The Blue Ocean strategy is about value innovation, and this is a terminology that they introduced in the book. Value innovation means the simultaneous pursuit of differentiation and lower cost. So it's not just about being different. It's about being different with a dramatically lower cost. We align the innovation that we have with functionality or utility, with cost, cost, internal cost, and price to the outside world. And here's a, a diagram that, that explains it for a little bit. They talk about the costs being at the top and the value being at the bottom. We want to eliminate some of the costs and lower or reduce other costs. At the same time, we are raising value by providing value in a way that nobody else has ever provided value and create new value such that, such that we really stand out in the marketplace. This is an important diagram in the book and a very important concept. The concept, again, being that we don't just don't lower costs, but we lower costs and raise value at exactly the same time. The Blue Ocean Strategy asks four very, very important questions related to value innovation. First, which factors should be created that the industry has never offered before? What can we do that nobody else has even thought to offer before? 
Second question is which one of the factors or competitive factors in the industry that, that the industry takes for granted should be totally eliminated? What should we not do that everybody else is doing that can lower our costs and allow us to create value in unique ways? Which factors should be raised well, well above the industry standard is question number three. And question number four is which factors, again, competitive factors, should be reduced well below the industry standard. You take the, these four questions and the answers to these four questions and map them out graphically in terms of the four actions framework, where you list the, the ways in which we're going to create new things in the upper left-hand corner, where we, where we list the things we're going to raise in the upper right, and we list things we're going to eliminate in the lower left and reduce in the lower right. This is a classic framework, and I'm going to give you some examples about that here in just a minute. The first example that I want to give you of a company that effectively applied the Blue Ocean strategy is Yellowtail Wine. Now, I'm not much of a wine drinker, and perhaps some of you on the call are not either, but you can still learn a lot from the competitive strategies of Yellowtail Wine. They decided that they were going to reduce the number of flavors offered by their winery. They were going to reduce the price when compared to premium wines. They were going to eliminate all the sophisticated terminology and the complexity associated with wines. And they were going to raise their marketing investment. In fact, they were going to market their wine in a way that was uniquely different in the wine industry. They decided to build a strategy canvas. And a strategy canvas is another key concept in the, con in the context of the Blue Ocean Strategy. To, to develop your own strategy can canvas, you determine what the principal comparison factors are going to be, and then you map out your major competitors in this strategy canvas so you can find where the Blue Ocean is. And here's, what, uh, the blue, or here's how the strategy canvas that came out of the Yellowtail Wine um, in the Yellowtail Wine analysis. First, they mapped out the industry factors. They said price was a big factor. The images that are used in the labeling and the use of esoteric terminology was a huge factor. High marketing costs was another factor. The aging and the quality of the wine was a big factor in the wine industry. The prestige of the vineyard and its legacy was often touted by competitive wineries. The complexity of the wine's taste was often seen as a tremendous advantage and ways in which you could stand out. And most wineries offered a very diverse range of wines to cover all varieties of grapes and consumer preferences. So when Yellowtail Wines decided to map this out on the strategy canvas, here's what they came out with. They said the U.S. wine industry in the late 1990s had very high prices with, with, with premium wines. And this is the, the mapping according to premium wines. That they had very high prices, that they had very sophisticated terminology, that they had very high costs for marketing and very sophisticated marketing campaigns. They really emphasized the age of the wine and the taste of the wine based upon the age. They emphasized the prestige of the winery itself, the complexity of the flavors that they were bringing to market, and they would typically offer a very wide range of wines. You know, not, very, not, not uncommon at all to have 30 or more different ranges of wines in all kinds of different flavors. And that was the way premium wines were being marketed in the late 1990s. They also decided to include in their strategy canvas the budget wines. The budget wines had a very low price, especially compared to the high prices of the premium wines. They had a very, they still also had sophisticated terminology. Their marketing budgets and their marketing sophistication was less, as well as their emphasis on aging and their emphasis on the prestige of the winery. They didn't talk nearly as much about the complexity of wines, and they typically had a lower range. Well, what the folks at Yellowtail Wines decided was that there was a way to compete there, and here's what they decided to do. They decided to offer a wine that was neither a premium wine nor a budget wine, a wine that carried a price that was somewhere in the middle. But they decided to make this your everyday wine. 
something that was not pretentious, something that didn't carry a bunch of terminology. Their belief was that there were a lot of families in the marketplace who enjoyed wine, but they got confused whenever they were looking at a wide range of selection, and they didn't, didn't really relate to the very sophisticated terminology or conversations about the complexity of wine. They thought if we bring a very simple wine to marketplace that's fairly priced, where we don't talk about the terminology and where we don't have the very sophisticated marketing campaigns and we don't talk about aging and the prestige of our winery so much and the complexity of the wines as being significant factors in the buying decision that they could carve a tremendous place in the marketplace. They also decided when they came out to have a very limited range of wines. In fact, they came out with just a couple of wines, a yellow wine and a red wine, and that was it. And so they, and the way that we mapped their decisions about how they were going to compete in the marketplace is in the grid or in the four actions framework. So again, to repeat, they created a wine that had very easy selection and very easy drinking, something that was totally non-pretentious and non-arrogant. They raised the price of the wine versus budget wines, so somebody wasn't thinking they were buying Bally High or Mogan David 2020 or some of the other very inexpensive wines in the marketplace. Thunderbird, I think, was a favorite in college of mine. Um, they raised the retail store involvement because with the higher prices came higher margins for the retail stores. So they found a way to engage the retail stores in their marketing campaigns. They eliminated the use of sophisticated terminology and any sort of sophistication based upon the aging uh, and the sophisticated marketing approaches that other wineries had. And they reduced the complexity of wine, again, the range or the, or the number of products that they offered, and any emphasis at all on vineyard prestige. And the results were phenomenal. They grew tremendously in the 1990s. And now they're all over the world. Now I might say also they've expanded the range of their wine a little bit. Now they offer about 10 flavors instead of the original two that they came out with. But they still market their wine as a very simple wine, very unpretentious, very non-arrogant, just a good quality table wine that can be enjoyed by consumers, uh, whoever you are, and at whatever price range that you have. It was an extremely effective marketing campaign. Another example of a company that effectively introduced and used Blue Ocean Strategies is Cirque du Soleil. I don't know if any of you have been to one of their performances. I had the pleasure of going to one in Las Vegas that I thought was really exciting. What Cirque du Soleil did was essentially reinvent the entire circus industry and came out with a product that was so different than other circuses that it really was not a circus at all. They created a merger of the theater and circus. They created multiple themed shows. First, they only had one theme show, and then they came out with several more. And they created permanent venture venues instead of, instead of circuses that just toured all the time. They came out with an act or a, an offering that was so dramatically successful that they could put it in permanent v venues. They eliminated the three wing rings. They eliminated the animals, and they raised the level of artistry, lighting, and sta staging, and at the same time, they significantly lowered their cost. And when we take all of these decisions that Cirque du Soleil had created and put them into the four action framework, this is what we get. Again, they created a circus that was themed from top to bottom. They created new artistry in the context of the circus with very sophisticated lighting and costuming and make makeup. They created a circus in a refined environment. Because they did things like eliminate the animals and eliminate the aisle concessions, now they could put the circus in convention centers and in halls where circuses could never go before because of issues with the animals. Not, not every convention center out of there wanted to deal with, with elephant poop. So by eliminating the animals, they opened themselves up to a lot of potential venues. They raised the venue, the quality of the venue that the circus or this, it's hard to even call this a circus. It's more theater than circus. They raised the quality of the venue in which they were performing, and they were able to raise the price because this was not 
your standard blue collar circus. This was theater. This was art. This was, you know, a high prestige kind of environment. Again, they eliminated all the star performers, so they don't introduce their performers at all. They don't headline acts at all. Their, their performers are simply actors in the play, and none of them are headlined. They eliminated the animals. You can't buy popcorn and other concessions in the aisles anymore. And they dramatically reduced the rings from, instead of having a three-ring performance, down to a single-ring performance. In fact, they eliminated the ring altogether. They eliminated the humor. There's no clowns going around to see how many clowns that you can pack into a car or, or how funny you can be with explosions and, and clowns on horseback and that kind of sort of thing. And they eliminated the thrills and replaced, while they still have advanced artistry, it's more gymnastics artistry than it is acrobatics. So they reduced the thrills and increased the artistry at exactly the same time. So they have been phenomenally successful just like, like, like Yellowtail Wine has been in the way that they have created an entirely new marketplace for themselves, one in which they have enjoyed very high margins, really good prices, and now they've got permanent shows. I counted online before today's presentation, and I think they've got eight permanent locations in Las Vegas alone where each one of them has a different theme. And you can go to Vegas for two weeks and see a Cirque du Soleil act every single night and hardly repeat yourself. So they have been phenomenally successful in applying the value innovation framework of reducing the cost because you have no animals, no star performers. You've really dramatically reduced the cost and at the same time raising the value and raising the price. So here are the characteristics of a really good strategy and hopefully one that you'll be able to employ in your business. First of all, focus. You just focus on being different in a very few key competitive ways. We don't have to be different in all of the ways. We just want to be significantly different in a few of the most significant competitive factors so that we stand out. We stand out so much that we've completely created a divergence. We benchmark our competitors, and then we find a way to be completely different in very key competitive factors. And we have a compelling tagline. So that's one of the key strategies that they say are characteristic of a good strategy in the book is to have a compelling tagline that is truthful, simple, and very compelling. So here's some examples of those taglines. The first one, a dramatic mix of circus, arts, and street entertainment. Of course, that's Cirque du Soleil. And a competitive type, a compelling tagline for Yellowtail Winery is a fun and simple wine to be enjoyed every day. Very simple, very good positioning. And here's the third one we haven't talked about. You are now free to move about the country. Now, most of you will recognize that as being the tagline for Southwest Airlines. And they also employed very effectively the entire Blue Ocean strategy when they created their company in the late 80s and 90s. They totally created new boarding procedures. In fact, they eliminated seat assignments so that your boarding procedures are just based on a first come, first serve. Whoever got there first gets to board first, and there are no seat assignments. They created entirely new service procedures, and they created a lot of fun. I remember the first time I rode on Southwest Airlines when I was living in Dallas, Texas, they had a shuttle service between Dallas and Houston, and we'd show up at the airport, and you never knew about the fun that was going to be available on Southwest. Instead of having high-priced uh, uniforms, the, the people were wearing blue jeans or khaki shorts and short sleeve shirts and crazy ball caps, and they were saying fun things on the aircraft itself and just turning it into a bit of a 30-minute a party on the shuttle service from Dallas to Houston. They raised the frequency of flights, so much so that you never even had to have a reservation back in those days. You just show up at the airport and get on the next flight out if it was available, have yourself a donut or two, and jump on the next flight. They had very friendly service, very rapid check-in speed, and surprisingly, they raised the partnership level with unions. I thought originally that Southwest Airlines didn't have any unions at all because they operate so different from other unions. But the truth is that they have great relationship with six different unions, and they consider every single union to be a partner. 
They've only had one six-day strike in the history of Southwest Airlines, and now every time that one of the unions wants to raise their head and, and, and compete with essentially the other unions and have unreasonable demands, Southwest Airlines doesn't have to do much at all because the other unions will pick up the phone and call the one that they think is being unreasonable and say, hey, don't screw up a good thing here. You need to be reasonable in your demands. And, and so it's essentially the unions are partners with Southwest Airlines and help them compete in the marketplace by understanding the partnership and by being very reasonable. As we mentioned, they totally eliminated seat assignments. They eliminated any frills, on onboard meals, any sort of high sophisticated lounges. They do have their rewards club, but they don't offer you know, quite the same sophistication of rewards club as American Airlines and United Airlines and some of their competitors. They reduced the price so that they were the low cost airlines for a long time. They reduced any sort of formality. They reduced the models of aircraft. So they fly almost all 737s, I believe, these days. Um, I think they flew 707s in the early days, and they replaced them all with a fleet of, of 7, 737s. And they significantly reduced the turnaround time. In fact, now with Southwest Airlines, they try to turn their jets around in 20 minutes. From 20 minutes from the time that a jet pulls up at the gate, they're taking off again just 20 minutes later. And they have such great relationships with their unions that it's not just the cleaners that are coming in and cleaning the aircraft. The flight attendants are beginning to clean the aircraft from the second that they land. And that even the, the, the pilots will get out and help clean the aircraft and prepare it because they know that one of their key competitive advantages is that they can turn that aircraft around in 20 or 25 minutes. So they have very effectively used the principles of the blue ocean strategy to raise the value by decrease and decrease the cost at exactly the same time and for the longest time they had essentially no competitors in their marketplace whatsoever. So here's the bottom line for you. You don't have to compete head on. You don't have to compete. You don't have to play the game in the same way that your competitors are playing the game. You can Look to innovate, raise your value, and lower your costs simultaneously, and focus just on a few factors. You can eliminate, you can look to eliminate, reduce, raise, and create to the point of making the competition totally irrelevant. That's been our agenda for today. We talked about basic oceanography, or the terms that came from Blue Ocean Strategy. Talked briefly about the six principles that are outlined in the book described what they mean by value innovation, talked about the four actions framework and the strategy canvas and gave you an example of how the strategy canvas can help you visualize your competitive opportunities, talked about characteristics of a good strategy and summed it all up for the bottom line. So here's your homework. I want you to think about ways in which you can make the competition irrelevant. Think about ways in which you can stand out so much that you're essentially creating a brand new marketplace and creating a way of competing that leaves your competition in the dust. I encourage you to get a strategy coach for support if you haven't done this before. One of the things that I've done since 2005 is help my clients talk through and create their own, created, uh, their own action framework and create their own blue ocean strategy. And I want to also include, encourage you in between now and the next call that we have is to invite somebody else for these calls. Uh, if you found value from this call or found value from the other 43 office hours presentations that we've done, please invite somebody else to join us because I really am passionate about doing everything I can to help small business owners be successful. We'll have questions and answers here in just a minute. We'll allow you to have comments and questions on the topic of the day and then any other issues. I'd like for you to tell me what your biggest takeaways are and your insights you gain from this presentation and tell me what you're going to focus on. You can do that by either typing into the chat window here or by going to the Brilliant uh, Business Group on Facebook. As you get to know me, you'll know that I'm not just another pretty face. I'm not just another normal business consultant. I don't want a lot of your money. I want you to spend an appropriate amount of money on education on coaching, on training and support, but I just want you to get the support that you really need, that you can really use right now, and that you can afford right now. 
I also don't want you to jump into the deep end of the pool before you learn to swim. If you're listening to this and you haven't started your business yet or you're beginning to start a new business, then I strongly encourage you not to jump into that business without getting appropriate education and support. If you're already in the business, then I want to throw you a life preserver and help you learn to swim in the competitive environment that you find yourself in or create a strategy to move into a completely different ocean uh, if you possibly can. I also don't believe that belief and persistence will guarantee success. And that's why we offer support services in the way of education, training, consulting, and coaching. I've seen a lot of people believe that their belief in themselves and their hard work and their persistence would guarantee their success. But as I'm sure many of you on the call realize, that that's not true. You really need education and support. You need to have a winning strategy in addition to the belief in yourself and the persistence and hard work and massive action that it takes to be successful. So I encourage you to sign up for a free coaching session where we'll take a look at what you're doing and, the, and help you and the, any sort of roadblocks that you're experiencing and help you overcome them. And I really think the value can be enormous. We've had people gain $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 worth of value from just a simple 30-minute coaching session. So when you can, email Stephanie at paulhoyt.com. Stephanie is a senior consultant here with our firm and, and my leading sales coach and leading coach as well. She's on the call today and will join us in just a minute to, to relay the questions that you have presented to us. But she's really fantastic in her coaching ability. Uh, that I, so I encourage you to get to know her and I encourage you to connect with her. You can email her at, at stephanie at paulhoyt.com or if you want to give me a shout, I'll relay the message to her. I also encourage you to purchase the CEO training program that I created last year called Beyond Business Survival. It's what you need to know when you're the CEO. It gives you a grounding in business success principles. Everybody who's gone through this program has had outstanding reviews of it. So I strongly encourage you to think about going through it yourself. Our next office hours will be on August the 25th. That's two weeks from today because next week, I'm going to be at CEO Space, and I typically skip the first Monday at CEO Space. But I'll be back for the second Monday and broadcasting from my hotel room on the subject of tribal leadership. I believe that's going to be the subject for two weeks from today. And as always, I want you to let me know what subjects you would like for me to address at paulsurvey.com. And in between now and the next call, do your homework. Um, and with that, we're going to open it up to questions and answers and any sort of discussions. First, comments and questions on the subject of today, the Blue Ocean Strategy, any takeaways or insights that you gained, and you can give it, fill out the survey at, at paulsurvey.com, and my contact information is on the screen. So with that, let's open it up to any sort of questions and discussion. Stephanie, come online with me and share any sort of questions that you might have. Okay. Awesome. I Let's see, we got a comment from Don. He says, thanks again for all the hard work. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, Don. We got a couple, couple comments from Darlene here. Just a second, let me get there. She says, crowdfunding is a great Blue Ocean example for raising funds for projects. It's not equity, but just donations. We can talk a little bit um, about crowdfunding um, later on after some of the questions out there. I'd love to have a have an opportunity to talk a little bit about crowdfunding. So maybe we can do that at the end of the presentation today. Great idea. Great idea. The, let's see, Darlene also has a question here. Uh, when you are in the blue ocean, often you are doing something that has never been done before, and the legal parameters are not clear. Do you have any suggestions on how to protect yourself legally when you are, when you are embarking on the blue ocean? Wow. I, and I, I think the... the the best answer there is no, not really. I think it depends on the ocean that you're in. And Darlene, I'm familiar with your project. And you really do kind of have a blue ocean strategy out there, doing something that I haven't seen anybody do before. Um, and, um, you know, there may be one or two folks out there that are doing something similar to what you're doing. But I think that you're square in that blue ocean. And I think you're absolutely right. Because when you're in a blue ocean, when you've created a whole new market space, uh, there may be some unknown legal issues that need to be faced. And I think I, I don't have any advice other than get great attorneys on your team. And I mean that in plural, too, because when it comes to attorneys, I, 
I, they are experts in ways in which I am not expert, so I always try to apply the three expert rule and never take the opinions and the advice of just one attorney as being the gospel. So I encourage you to, to reach out to multiple attorneys to see what you can do about making sure you're taking care of yourself from a legal standpoint in your particular blue ocean. And thanks very much for the question. Hopefully I'll have a chance to see you at CEO Space next week. Next question, Stephanie. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot of money. How can I implement these principles? That's a, that's a good question because when you compete with people in a way that's not head-on, then you, you can actually compete with less money than you would otherwise. So essentially the, the equation is this, the more unique you are in the marketplace, the less marketing dollars you may have to spend. And I say may have to spend because what's, what's really important there is whether or not you have a differentiation that's very, very clear. If the marketplace rap very quickly understands the ways in which you are different, then you may have an opportunity to have reduced marketing expenses. So if I came out with a consulting offering that was, which I think is dramatically different from other folks in the industry, but the differences were not readily obvious, I might actually have to spend a lot of money in marketing to explain why I'm different and why the value that I can bring is you know, different than other consultants in the marketplace. But if I was able to come out with things like Yellowtail wine, you know, a simple wine that can be enjoyed every day, or Cirque du Soleil, you know, the, a merger of theater and circus, or Southwest Airdyne, every, everyday low prices, well, that's Walmart, but now you're free to move about the country. If, you, if your uniqueness is obvious and very, very clear, then I think you can actually compete, or not compete, but you can carve out a brand new marketplace without, without spending a lot of marketing dollars at all. Um, one good strategy here might be on a book called Cross, From Crossing the Chasm, which is maybe the subject of a future office hours presentation because I really love Crossing the Chasm as a, as a demonstrable book. But one of the points mm -hmm. that Jeff Moore makes in the book, uh, Crossing the Chasm, is that you start out your marketing dollars in, in a tiny little marketplace or in a niche marketplace that you can dominate. So with a with a very clear value proposition, with a very unique offering, and with a small enough marketplace, you can begin to dominate that marketplace with not very much marketing dollars at all. So I think those are the key. The way that you position yourself, the way that you make your value obvious, and the size of the marketplace in which you are trying to play. So for example, if I decided I wanted to go nationwide all at once, um, that's going to take millions of dollars. In fact, the rule of thumb is if you want to create a, a brand awareness nationwide, it's about a $5 million investment in all kinds of different services and maybe more today. That $5 million number came about you know, six or seven years ago. Um, but if I want to create a dominant position in a very local marketplace, I may be able to do that for a few hundred dollars or a few thousands of dollars depending upon how unique I am and how clear my value proposition is to my market audience. Next, nice question. Next question, Stephanie. What are some other ways of competing? Um, I think one of the, in, in the, the Art of War by Sun Tzu, spelled S-U-N-T-S-U, -S I believe, or T-Z-U, I see it spelled sometimes. He talks about various competitive strategies one of the competitive strategies is head-on, which means that, you know, I'm going to meet your army head-on, absolutely, and we're just going to duke it out face-to-face. -face. Um, another competitive strategy is flanking, which means I'm going to come at it from the side with kind of a, an alliance approach or a complementary offering kind of approach that I'm going to let you have, as my competitor, a dominant market position and at least at first, I'm not going to compete head-on with you. I'm going to come to it from the side, which is called a flanking strategy. It's very famous in, in actual warfare itself, is we don't, we don't battle our, our enemy head-on. We come at them from the sides and chip away. And the third strategy that's in the book, The Art of War, is the fragmentation strategy, 
where we don't pick a battle head on. We'll just pick a smaller battle with a smaller section of the marketplace. So those are the three classic ways of competing is a head-on strategy, which is usually very expensive and very dangerous, a flanking strategy, which, can, which you can do without too much money at all to provide a complementary offering and just kind of take away a small chunk of the, of the competitor's market share. And the third one is fragmentation, where instead of competing head-on, you're going to divide the customer up into you know, five or six different pieces and just take on one of them and establish a beachhead and establish a financially stable business so that you can begin to take on the competitors from a position of strength after that. So those are the three classic strategies. Next question, Stephanie. Okay. Can you eliminate the competition forever? Um, I think the answer is no. You can't eliminate the competition forever. So I take, um, for example, Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines is a good example. They had a dominant market position for a long, long time. And now, once they have established that position and built upon it, they still are, they still push themselves as being a value-based, fun environment where there's no seat assignments and a lot of fun when you fly with them. But they're not necessarily the lowest price anymore. They've expanded the number of routes they've had to where they're in like almost every major city in the United States. They used to, when they first started, just go to commercial airports or complementary airports. For example, it took them many years before they got into Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. They flew out of Love Field in Dallas, Texas for the longest time, and they flew to Hobby Field in uh, Houston, Texas. But now they're in Houston Bush International Airport, and now they're in... Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, as well as many, many other international airports, too. So when they came out in the marketplace, they, they essentially have a totally different competitive structure today than they did 20, 30 years ago when they first come out because other people started emulating them and started copying what they have done, and they started expanding, too. Another example of that would be Yellowtail Wine. Versus came out with just two wines, a yellow and a red, and now they have 10 flavors. So once you establish, once you use the Blue Ocean strategy to establish your beachhead and to establish yourself in the marketplace and to establish a very rapidly growing, highly profitable company, then as you begin to expand and as you begin to grow and as your competition begins to copy what you are doing, then you find yourself in a much different competitive positioning. But you find yourself in that positioning with an offering that's, that provides high margins and has a very loyal customer base and has a, a really firmly established market position. So you can't eliminate the competition forever because people will come in and compete with you because you've established a new marketplace and now they know the rules of the game and now they can come in and create an offering that it is competitive to yours. But you can establish a dominant position in the marketplace that can last you for years and years or decades and decades. Nice question. Next one, Stephanie. Okay. okay. Um, how do established companies reinvent themselves, she wants to know. That is a t much tougher one. We t and, and by the way, the last two principles that we talked about earlier of the six principles of the Blue Ocean Strategy um, were around existing companies reinventing themselves, making sure that execution is built in with strategy, making sure that you're over able to overcome the internal roadblocks. There have been quite a few books written on this. One of them, I can't remember the exact name. I think it's like the Innovation Challenge or something like that, uh, that essentially says that big companies can't reinvent themselves. It's not possible for an oil tanker to become you know, a PT boat. It's just not going to happen. The way that large companies reinvent themselves is primarily two ways. Number one is they purchase another company that is doing something dramatically different from them, but typically in the same market space, and they begin to throw a lot of marketing dollars and a lot of their clout into the new company. And the other way is to create totally separate divisions. And these totally separate divisions of the big established company are chartered with doing something that the, that the 
the big behemoth company uh, cannot possibly do. So they will typically hire somebody who has um, you know, experience being an entrepreneur and a demonstrated track record of success with entrepreneurship, set up an entirely new division or an entirely new company and begin to compete because they know that existing policies and procedures, salary structures, compensation structures, all of that is not going to work in an environment where you're trying to grow extremely rapidly in a very entrepreneurial sense. So in essence, kind of the answer to that is how does a, a big company reinvent themselves? They really don't. They don't reinvent themselves very well. They create an entirely new venture, either through acquiring other companies or through creating a new subsidiary or division of their company that is chartered with doing business in a completely different way. Next question. That's fascinating. I, I find that concept fascinating. Okay, here's a good one. I had an idea for a business and I couldn't find any competition at all. I was told that that was a bad sign and I don't understand why competition is a good sign. Why is competition a good thing? Competition is good because it validates the marketplace. And by the way, I give that advice to people any, too. If you're opening up something and, and a brand new product or service to market, and when you say the words, I have no competition, that is a huge warning flag and a red flag, and your antenna ought to start buzzing out there. Because it means one of two things. It's either an untapped marketplace, like we addressed with the Blue Ocean strategy, or it's a marketplace where the marketplace is just an illusion and it really doesn't exist. Or dozens or hundreds of other competitors have tried to compete in that marketplace and they haven't done very well and they've all abandoned the market and left it. So bottom line is it means one of those two things. Either there's untapped market potential and you do have a blue ocean opportunity, or it's an illusory marketplace that really doesn't exist and people have tried to compete in that marketplace before and been very unsuccessful and that's why they abandoned the marketplace. So I think it's a good idea to be wary uh, because you got one of those two things going on. Um, in the red ocean, it's very clear what the rules of the game are and wh who the market is and who the customer is because you've got a lot of people going after them and it's very easy to understand what it is that people are buying and why they are buying it and how your competitors are positioning themselves in the marketplace. Not so much whenever you come up with, we have no competition. By the way, one of the things to look for in areas like that is what I call indirect competition, where people are offering a similar value but not in the same way. An example of indirect competition might be that uh, there are four hamburger joints you know, within a mile of my house, but there's no no Chick-fil-A or no chicken place within 10 miles. So the hamburger places are providing indirect competition in that they're, they're satisfying the need in the marketplace, which is the need to have fast food, but they're not supplying it in anywhere close to the same way. So instead of saying that we're looking for no competition, look for indirect competition. Finding ways that your, your customers are buying things, but but you've got an opportunity to sell them something that satisfies the need, but the something you're selling them is dramatically different than that. So Southwest Airlines would be another good example of that. It was clear that people needed to fly, but they were able to, so they had indirect competition, but they reinvented themselves and reinvented the industry so much that they were so innovative and did so many things different that they really stood out in the crowd and essentially had no competition on their routes for being a low-priced um, airlines like they were for many, many years. Next question. Can you talk about the push versus versus push versus, <laughs> versus pull marketing in the blue ocean? Boy, that was a tough one for an easy word. Um, Generally speaking, push marketing means you're going out and looking for clients and you're looking at them directly. You're looking for them directly. You're pushing your message out to specific people and trying to get a response. A good, I, good example of push marketing would be any sort of direct marketing, like an email campaign or a direct marketing campaign where you're sending out 
um, where you're sending out uh, mailers to to doorsteps, you know, you're directly going after somebody and pushing your message out to who you believe your customers are. Pull marketing campaigns is where you create an offer or you create a value and you let it attract people to you. Um, so oftentimes in social media we will have pull market campaigns where the market itself kind of discovers itself and the market finds you as opposed to you going out and trying to get into the marketplace. When it comes to the blue ocean itself, um, I, I'm not sure whether, I th I'm guessing that both push and pull would be effective marketing strategies for reaching your marketplace. If you know specifically who your market is and how to reach them, a push strategy might be very effective. If you're not really sure of who your market is, and how they're going to find you just to come out with your name and offering and being very clear about who you are in, a, in the context of a broader marketing message um, might pull those to you, might, might actually let your customers emerge and be attracted to you because they find you because, of, because they're already looking for a way to satisfy a need and a way to gain value in the marketplace. That was a tough question. I'm not, um, one of the reasons I have, um, two folks with me on my team here, Marcel and Stephanie, is because they have uh, more marketing experience and marketing expertise than I do. So that was a tough question for me. I Hopefully I answered it in a reasonable way. Stephanie. That's it. We've got all the questions thus far. Well, we may have a little time to. Darlene had a question or some comments about crowdfunding. When earlier, so I want to open it up and talk a little bit about crowdfunding campaigns. As it turns out, that I believe that there are three different types of crowdfunding. One is donation-based, second is rewards-based, and third is equity-based. So there's a lot of a blend in between donation-based crowdfunding and rewards-based crowdfunding. But a pure donation-based crowdfunding campaign might be you know, we're wanting to start up a new church or something and we're just looking for donations. Or somebody had a tragic accident or a circumstance in their life and we're seeking donations. Uh, and we're not offering anything in reward for that um, other than just, you know, the satisfaction of doing a good thing for somebody that you cared about. Rewards-based or crowdfunding can be in a lot of different flavors. Sometimes that's getting a reward for a donation. So, for example, we uh, donate $60 to the local public broadcasting station and we get a CD of the three tenors performing or some other performance that you really like in return. Or rewards based might be buy my product ahead of it coming out. So if you buy the product today, then you'll be one of the first people to get the product and you'll also get some bonuses with that. So we're funding the development of a product and we're actually selling the product before the product has been created. And essentially, unless we raise enough funding, the product won't be created. That's a very classic way of doing it. So rewards-based can be either a reward that's given to people in return for a donation or a reward in the sense of a product that you're offering, but we are selling the product in crowdfunding before we have actually created the product. So those are the two classic ways of crowdfunding that are legal in the marketplace today. Donations-based crowdfunding and rewards-based crowdfunding, and right smack dab in the middle of that is a donation that comes with some sort of a donus, a bonus. Give us $50 and we'll send you a t-shirt kind of an offering. Um, the third one is crowdfunding, uh, equity-based crowdfunding, which really kind of doesn't exist yet. The, the laws have been passed. But there's a lot of, I don't know any securities attorneys that are, that are really high on, or any investors, by the way, that are high on equity-based crowdfunding. My belief is that it's still premature. You can do a public offering either through a 506, uh, 506DC, I believe it is, 506C, something like that, that's it, a 506C offering or a Regulation A offering, which are, in essence, public offerings are crowdfunding offerings, too. But they're different. They're not private offerings. They're public, public offerings. So I, that's, um, 
I hope that helps you out a little bit with regards to crowdfunding and what I consider to be the three classic types of crowdfunding. The one that's most common, by the way, today is reward-based crowdfunding, where we are either giving a reward for a donation or we're giving, uh, we're actually selling our products ahead of time through a crowdfunding campaign. And with that, I've got 12.59, which brings us to the top of the hour. So I'm going to close out here and remind you that the next Office Hours presentation will be in two weeks, on Monday, August the 25th, where I'll be broadcasting from a hotel room in Lake Las Vegas. Uh, for those of you who may be listening to the recording or attending live, hopefully I can see you next week when I am at my 50th 5-0 CEO Space Conference coming up just next week. So until we do meet again, either in the next Office Hours presentation or face-to-face -face at CEO Space or on a phone call somewhere, this is Paul Hoyt wishing you a most marvelous and prosperous day. Thank you. Bye-bye.